what does manhood mean to you? Oh, it is uh, the first the recognition of a privilege um, based on a society that was founded to put men first, um, which means, therefore, that you have to understand that that privilege exists already in society and then work uh, within it to erode it for people who don't get to benefit from it. And so- To another edition of King Crush Thursday, the series where we highlight and uplift Black men, because frankly, not too many people are doing it. My name is Val Gay, and I am super excited about this brother today. He is, first of all and foremost, I would like to say, he is West Philadelphia born and raised. (laughs) But he's also, he's an educator, he's a creative, he's a dancer, he's a founder. He is the first Black man to receive a doctorate in dance at the Texas Women's University. That's something. And he is an amazing thinker. Please welcome Dr. Aquel Shahid. Hi, Aquel. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. That was such a great introduction. Thank you. I am well. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm doing very well. I'm so happy that I get to talk to you. And while um, you are the founder of Dance I quell, you are wrap, uh, wrapping that beautiful uh, shirt and that beautiful company, Philodenko. I Another know. Philodenko. Once a child, Pleasure. always a child, Adenko, right? Sorry, I, you know, can't, I can't leave home. So, you know, that is true. I got to always keep Philly with me and Danko with me. That's awesome. So glad to hear it. So glad to hear it. So, I quell, thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of this conversation where we are building a repository of six questions on our way to 100 answers by 100 different positive Black men. Because our goal really is to shift the narrative about um, the myopic view that our broader community has, or the broader society, I should say, has about Black men and Black manhood, if you will. Um, And hopefully one day, perhaps a young brother who may or may not have positive black male role models in his life can look at this repository, see these same six six questions and find among the array of a hundred different answers, guidance for him. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps the rest of us who maybe are neither um, male or even black to also look into these questions and see answers and get a better perspective of a group of people that in my mind are often myopically portrayed and are maligned more than not. Mm. And so um, I'm so glad that you're here to be a part of this conversation. And with that, I'm gonna get started with the first question, which is, what does manhood mean to you? Oh, it is uh, the first recognition of a privilege um, based on a society that was founded to put men first, um, which means therefore that you have to understand that that privilege exists already in society and then work uh, within it to erode it for people who don't get to benefit from it. And so when people say the phrase, be a man, to me, that's what I hope people recognize. Well, to be a man is to recognize that the society was already benefited for you as a man. We can talk about uh, how that differs for black men versus white men, um, but, but manhood nonetheless. And then how do you use that privilege to bring along those who are um, women or those who are trans uh, men and trans women, those who are gender non-binary, those who who are disabled, those who are um, uh, less fortunate in in any other way, whether it's through age or through ability or disability um, or through gender bias. Um, So that's what manhood means to me. That's what it means to be a man. Awesome, excellent, thank you so much. So, Aquil, who and or what is important to you? 
who and or what? Um, I think for me right now, if I can speak for today, it um, it is the uh, the men that I'm working with with Dance Like Well, right? And so right now we're currently in October of 2022, and we're working on a project that is about reshaping the narrative that Black men, particularly Black men that have found themselves um, for one reason or another involved in the incarceral system or affected by the incarceral system to recast that narrative um, about them being criminals or deviants to society or something other than human. Um, and so um, right now, the, the men that I work with very closely in the studio to build that artwork um, are who I hold dear because the work itself is recasting the narrative we have with each other in the way that we leave the space in our everyday life that then hopefully the artwork will be affected by it and then anybody that's watching the artwork or coming into our space will be affected by that and so then like ripples in, in a pond that work continues to um, grow and balloon and then everybody becomes somebody I care about because they are touched by the people who are touched by our process or the work and so, um, and that will exist, hopefully those ripples like DNA will exist after I'm gone, right? And so, you know, that'll be the contribution that I leave, hopefully, um, if it's just on one person, but I think I'm okay to say that it's it's eight people that I'm working with right now that I know it's having an effect on eight black men in West Philly. Um, outside of that, West Philly born and raised. So, you know, Mantua, is the Mantua and West Philly and Philly in general um, are the people I rock with. They're the people I rock for. So that is who I care about right now. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. So I, how do you want us to see you? How, well, first I want you to come see me on the stage. <laughs> That's how I want you to see me. Um, but outside of that, there is a, um, there are two murals around the city of Philly. Uh, one I've, I'm intimately familiar with as a, as a child. And in fact, when um, the Red Cross was deciding to claim its space that it currently occupies on the corner of 40th and Powhatan, um, there were controversies because the new building was going up in front of this mural. And I never really understood why I was drawn to the mural or why people who are older than me at the time had such affinity or reactions to the mural itself being covered. But the mural was um, as tall as a four foot story above grade um, house, right, exactly, that's the mural of a young black boy um, standing with like in a basketball pose with a striped you know, shirt on and some blue jeans. And of course he was a he was a boy, but he's seven feet or 14 feet, however tall that building is. Um, and it says, I am large, I can I contain multitudes. And to be able to walk past that mural every day um, is I guess what what those things are designed, what messages and representations are designed to do and symbols. It is to give you sort of the, not even sort of, it is to give you the understanding of yourself and how you can see yourself and how you can appreciate yourself and appreciate the people around you. So, you know, that's the first and foremost thing. Like I want people to see me as large and containing multitudes, even though I'm only five foot seven. Um, and those multitudes are complex, right? I am, as your introduction graciously said, you know, I'm a doctorate, uh, you know, I'm a, a, a PhD doctor, I'm an educator, so I'm tenured, I'm an artistic director, I'm an executive director, I'm on boards, uh, but I'm also fallible, like I don't sleep, I don't eat well, I probably overindulge in vices that are self-medicating because I'm dealing with the problems of being a human being and living a human existence. And so, you know, I want people to say, yeah, he was flawed and he was also like hopefully brilliant or he cared and he was, you know, dealing with life and all of those things. And I'm neither one nor the other. I'm all of those things. Um, and so, I want people to see me that way, but that also does tell to my second favorite mural. Well, three, there's a Patti LaBelle mural, mural that I love to around the city. Um, 
but yeah, I'll, con- I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that. I want people to see me as a complex, nuanced human being that is large and containing multitudes. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. And I love him. A little boy. I do. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so, I will. Um, what is your epic dream? Epic dream. Um, my epic dream uh, is the thing that will put me out of business. Like, you know, if racism didn't matter, if sexism didn't matter, if homophobia didn't matter. Um, that would be the beautiful place to live, or at least if it didn't matter in West Philly. And so my epic dream is to eradicate those those things, right? Um, specifically from the Black perspective. And that, again, is a multitude, right? So if we talk about one of those things, right? If we looked at all, if we looked at life as a spider web, and what we know about spider webs are we see these lines and these circles, but we at each line and circle intersect, there are joints. And spider webs are complex, right? And so you can go either way. And so if you took one line and you got at one joint, it takes a whole spider web to get through that one problem. What do I mean? Um, in order to erode sexism from the Black community, we have, have to erode the fabrics of um, white supremacy that held people captive on plantations and the way that that trauma has passed down through DNA for 400 years in order to educate people, to get people to a ground zero, to understand how sexism is affecting the Black West Philly community, right? And so that's a whole life project that you could do. Or homophobia, same thing. Or um, ableism, the same thing. And so, you know, my epic dream is to, you know, sort of put slashes in that spider web that is the spider web that keeps people running that rat race, right? If I can, one or two slashes across my lifetime that will give people a further advantage and a leg up on eradicating those things. Um, That's what I'm here to do. If I could eradicate it, I will, right? And then I'll figure out something else to do. Um, But that's my biggest dream is like using my art and using the connections that my art gives me to people as a way to eradicate the social conditions that continue to perpetuate the marginality, triviality, and denigration of Black folks in West Philly. Got it. Got it. So you've been sharing with us implicitly all along. And so I'm going to ask you explicitly now, though. So Dr. Iquel Shahid, who are you? Who am I? I'm a Black man from West Philly. That's who I am. I am a Christian. I am uh, a gay man. I am the child of uh, a single Black woman who also... I'm still trying to figure out post-mortem. I am the son, the grandson of um, a single Black grandmother who um, raised five kids on her own without the ability to read beyond an eighth grade reading level. Um, I am, yeah, I, I am a spiritual being who loves money and loves hard. And when you cross me, my not so Christianly side comes out. Let's put it that way. Um, but I'm a deep lover of, of people, and um, and I'm an artist, and I am a human. Yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And so here we are already at question six, which is: Is there anything that you wanted me to ask you that I didn't, or I should have asked you that I didn't? In other words, what did I miss? What did you miss? That's a great question, especially from my interview skills as a, you know, as a researcher too. Um, you know, I think where do I see if we're talking about men? You know, where do I see? these conversations or the identity of black men a hundred years from now. And um, I think that, I 
what I would hope that is um, that anybody listening to this, whether a day from now or a hundred years from now, will go back a hundred years prior to now and realize that black men supported their families, that they were raising their kids, that they bought land, that they read, that they owned businesses, that they collaborated and partnered, that they had disagreements with each other, but they knew how to deal with them civilly, even if they despised the, the, the polarization of their disagreement, that they knew how to work together and be combative. They were stark defenders of women, even if they had complicated relationships with them, that they were stark defenders of their family and their community and their faith. They were stark defenders of the American project of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that that it was such a powerful force that it was intentionally eradicated and intentionally sabotaged so that that would not continue to perpetuate further and further generations of Black men using manhood, again, the power of patriarchy, to strategically um, service the needs of their entire community beyond oneself. And they understood that oneself was always implicated in the way that they work together for community, because each one of us at, at, in the community are building the work on or building our own livelihoods in collaboration with everybody else. Meaning that I do for you because doing for you in turn does for me. Right. And so where I would hope a hundred years from now is that we'd cycled back to that and, and figured out a way to get back to that using the MLK, the Malcolm X, the um, Garvey's, the Carmichael's, um, uh, also the women who were sitting there, right? Mega Evers' wife, Fannie Lou Hamer, right? Sojourner Truth, right? Like the collaboration was deep, right? And it was intentionally through crack epidemic, through HIV and AIDS, through unfair housing, through Jim Crow, through 13th Amendment, through mass incarceration, through the lack of education, right? It was intentionally eradicated and it's still happening, right? Through um, through mixed media and multimedia. And I think that we have to really be at attentive to that and understand how to look back in history um, and get back to those principles, even if we do it differently. But that the answer to our freedom in the future is a retrospective look at our past. Oh my goodness, that was so beautiful. So beautiful, thank you. Thank, thank you. You, much. you know, um, one of the things that I admire about you is how you think and how you're, as an artist, as a, all the parts of you come together to see what is in front of you, but also to see what's in front of you that you may not be, one may not be able to see with the naked eye. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really grateful for that. Um, I'm grateful for your vision. I'm grateful for your thoughts. I'm grateful for your leadership. I'm grateful for how you rep where you come from. And so for that, I honor you, my king, and I pray that you get to continue, that your epic dream absolutely comes true, mm -hmm. and that you will continue to be more and more of yourself and continue to impact others. And I just thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you for having me, and I appreciate you, my queen, and thank you for all the work you do out here in these streets um, for similar um, reasons and for the many others that are unknown to us, but that we're all benefiting from, and so I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us. I hope that you were as enlightened and enjoyed this um, conversation as much as I did. And please, um, if there is a king, a black man in your life, a positive and successful black man in your life who you want to see highlighted in this forum, please click the link below or in my bio, fill out the nomination form, and we'll take it from there. I should say success does not equal what someone does for a living. They may, in fact, be a tenure professor in a university, as Dr. Arquell is, but they don't have to be. We are really looking at the quality and the content of people's characters and the impact that they are having on the people around them, their community, be it the nuclear family or the community writ large and everything in between. We want to talk to those brothers. And so please stay tuned next week for yet another interview with yet another amazing king. And in the meantime, please remember 
to spread love and have a great day. Thanks so much. And thank you, Iquil. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great.